Okay, maybe as he prepares to come, I'd like to recognize, uh, it's okay, it, just come, please, Karibu, Jacob, Karibu, uh, I'd like to recognize the Gugi family, um, and Professor Mkoma Wangugi has come with his wife, um, she's come all the way from New York to be with us, Dr. Buck, please just wave, stand and wave to us, <laughs> and the daughter Mudoni, just stand and wave to us. Nyambura, sorry, Nyambura, Nyambura, thank you, Karibu sana. Welcome, welcome. Mwafika awe anapenda lugha yake, anapenda kuliko cha 
wa e asante let's clap for him thank you very much thank you very much jacob and that's his trophy now this this uh, particular uh, award was started by dr lizzy atrey and uh, professor komo ruki thank you Okay, at this point, let's me invite um, the BBC academics to come and take it over from here. Welcome, uh, Professor Charity Irungu. Our Vice Chancellor. Our Vice Chancellor. And our distinguished professors, that is Professor Ngugi Wafiongo and Professor Mukoma Ngugi, invited guests, staff, and students of St. Paul's University, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wish to welcome you all to St. Paul's University, um, the university of your choice. Right? Now, St. Paul's University is um, where we train people holistically. I think I need to mention that before I even go ahead. And we are guided by two pillars, Christian spiritual formation and academic excellence. So that is why we say St. Paul's University is your university of choice. Thank you very much for coming. I will not keep you long because I know uh, what we are waiting for is to listen to our professors here. Um, today here we are privileged to have we are privileged here to host the sons of Dimuru. That is the two professors here. If you did not know, they actually come from Limuru. And so we are very excited today to have them here. Professor Mukoma Wangugi is um, here as a visiting professor from Cornell University, where he is a professor of literature. And uh, we are so privileged, Prof, for you to have chosen St. Paul's University out of the 70 plus universities in Kenya to come and be here. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. And to add icing on the cake, as if it was not enough, today he has actually brought to us his father, Professor Gugi Wafiumu. Thank you very much. I was telling Professor Ngugi Wafiumu when we met this afternoon, that when I was in uh, doing my O levels back in 1983, I did one of his books as a set book. We were doing The River Between. And today I'm privileged to have him here on our platform. And uh, that is a great privilege for me. So thank you, Professor, for agreeing to come. Uh, you can imagine how difficult it was then to read and understand that book and bring out the meaning that was in it at that particular time. But today we are very happy to have them and to add on to our many academic accolades at the university as we host them here. Um, Professor Mukoma Ngugi is here with us and um, so thank you very much. And um, one of the things that um, I really, really, really like about maybe the Professor Ngugi here is the fact that he's been away for so long, but mother tongue is very close to his heart. You know, it's very close to his heart. But for the time that Professor Mukoma has been here, the university has really benefited from him. Uh, this is the Department of um, 
the Department of Communication, uh, the students have had a time to interact with, with them, with him, and I'm sure they will not be the same again. So thank you very much for this privilege to be here. As a university, we continue to do what we do best, that is to bring the best out of our students. And so we do everything that is possible to see that we expose them the best way possible so that when they leave this place, they are able to compete with other students out there. And so we are very privileged as a university to have had Professor Mukoma here with us and to grace that with Professor Mbugi. As I've said, I will not keep you here long because I know what we are waiting for. So allow me at this point in time to invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Joseph Galgalo, to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Professor Gugiva Viongo, Professor Nkoma Gugi, distinguished guests present here, our dear, dear students, Nko, our faculty and staff members, and members of St. Paul's Primary who entertained us here earlier, and many others present. I want to take this opportunity to very warmly welcome you to St. Paul's University. Thank you for being here and for being part of this happy occasion this afternoon. Without further ado, I want us to get into the event for which we are gathered here today. But allow me to do three very brief introductions before we get into it. In the house today, we are really privileged here at St. Paul's University to have two very distinguished, world-renowned scholars, two great sons of this land, Kenya, who also happen to be father and son. The two hosted here by St. Paul's University will have a conversation, a conversation to which they will also invite us to participate at some point. The title that is given for this event is the Dwell on the Regis. And uh, when Professor uh, Irungu Charity mentioned this, Professor Wadiongo turned to me and in jest laughing say, I can tell you the Dwell will begin after the event, between him and the sun. <laughs> we wish you well. First, let me just introduce very briefly, because I have a very long written introduction put in my hand of this man and one lady that I want to introduce. I will make it very brief. Let me begin with the son, Professor Mkoma Ngugi. Professor Mkoma is a visiting scholar with us here at St. Paul's University. We are most privileged to have him in our midst, uh, impacting great um, uh, experience of learning um, on our students as well as interacting with our faculty here and adding, bringing great value to us here. We are most privileged to be in your village here and benefiting in this way. Thank you so much for being here. Professor Mokoma is a novelist, he's a poet, he's a scholar, he's an activist. He is a professor of English at Cornell University U.S. He has a very impressive long list, as you would expect, of publications. Allow me not to read it to save time. He is a writer, theorist, and distinguished professor um, in his field in English and comparative literature, just like his father, the great distinguished professor, Ngugi Wadiongo, who I will briefly introduce now, but a little more would be said by someone I will ask to come and say something about a uh, professor. Professor Ugi Wadiongo is a distinguished professor of English and comparative literature at the University of California. Most of us Kenyans and people in the region we get introduced, whether you like it or not, to Professor Ngugi Wadiongo in the school. A name you would only hear from the books which are part of the 
set, set books, eh? we call them set books. Eh? I remember from that, don't ask me whether I passed or failed. <laughs> if he marked it for me, probably I would have passed very well. Whip not child, you remember that? A grain of wheat, the river between, those are the very early ones which were part of our set book, our literature in high school and A levels as well. And we grew up knowing this man right, rightfully as a legend. You know what? The legend is in the house today. A little more would be said about him in a minute, just very briefly. But let me just uh, introduce one other person and then we will get into the event for the day. Today's event is organized courtesy of our communication department in the Faculty of Business, Communication and Computer Studies. We are grateful to the faculty and to the department. And with a little help, I want to say a little help, from none other than Professor Mukoma uh, Ngugi himself, who had a direct line, I guess, to the older Ngugi. Uh, and we are grateful that they are here and that this is happening today. The session would be moderated by none other than Dr. Joyce Jairo. We know her very well, I guess, particularly from her work that she does. She's a literary critic, just to say a few things. I have a long list of uh, things here, Dr. Tari, by way of introduction, but allow me not to read these very impressive uh, accolades of achievements that you have, but only to mention, she, we know her best as a literary critic, who um, uh, interviews very well musicians, novelists, you know, artists, they playwrights, cartoonists, and art managers. Most of us may know her from her works, written, published works. The, perhaps the most known one is the Ten Cities Public Sphere, Urban Space Culture Club, but also Kenya at 50. Anybody who knows that, if you haven't read it, look for that, please. Trends, identities, and the politics of belonging. She is in the house today, and she would be the moderator of the sessions that dwell on the regions between the father and the son. I know you didn't come to be entertained or to be treated to this. Without further ado, we will now get into that, but allow me to invite here very briefly Professor Mojola just to say one or two words by way of introduction about Professor Ngugiwa Diongo, and then we get into these sessions. Please come and make it very brief. Thank you, our Vice Chancellor, Reverend Dr. Joseph Galgali. All protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I will not take your time. I stand here as one of Professor Ngugi Wadiongo's students about 50 years ago, 72. <laughs> now, it's a rare privilege to, to, to say a few words about Professor Ngugi Wadiongo. Professor Ngugi Wadiongo uh, is a rare and unforgettable, was a rare and unforgettable lecturer an incisive, incisive thought-provoking teacher, transformative in the tradition of Paulo Freire, a highly acclaimed and celebrated son of Africa, a world-renowned Kenyan writer and academic, a world-class award-winning literary and social activist. Professor Ngugi is a native to this Limuru area, this neighborhood. He was educated at schools not far from here, Kamandura, Mangu, Kinyogori, you know them. He thereafter went to the prestigious Alliance High School in Kikuyu, not far from here, before moving on to worlds beyond. When I myself joined Alliance High School in the 1960s, Professor Ngugi's name was already gaining wide, wide, wide acclaim and popularity. His writings and stories have nurtured, inspired, informed, provoked, and influenced generations of Kenyans, Africans, and world citizens beginning with Whip Not Child and so on. I don't want to mention his ideas on decolonizing the mind. The use of vernaculars and mother tongues are well known. I myself have been inspired by Ngugi's writings. In fact, three of my recent books, one is called God Speaks in Our Own Languages. Uh, it is available out there. Another one is Bible Translation and Culture. 
critical intersections and reflections. And the third one, issues in Bible translation, navigating uh, troubling waters and tempestuous waters. Now, Professor Ngugi and, and, uh, Professor Ngugi and Professor Mukoma believe, I believe this is a homecoming. Professor Ngugi Mukoma is himself an accomplished poet writer, as has been said. Um, just to conclude, we are greatly honored here at St. Paul's University to witness this retrucho pei natal, this return to the land of birth, to the native soil of father and son for a kind of duel on the ridges. We wel warmly welcome these returning heroes and giants, father and son, who have had a powerful influence. And I stand here as an example of the influence they've had on a whole generation of us. Let us say hooray to Professor Ngugi and his son. Let us welcome them with, with, with Vigele Gele. Now, welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you very much. You now realize we did not only manage to bring three generations of the Ngugis here in this house, the father, the son, and the children, uh, grandchildren, Nyambura is in the house, but we also managed to fish out not only one of the recent students, but from half a century ago. Here he is, the exhibit is here. The stage is now set for the duel, the conversation between father and son, Mukoma and Ngogi. I will invite now Dr. Um, uh, Nyairo Joyce, if you don't mind, please come. And then let also the uh, Ngugi and the Yongo, if they can come to the, to the front as well, take the seats here. And from now on, I will hand it over to Dr. Nyairo to actually take us through the event for which you are here. Most welcome to this. Thank you so much. Who is the third mic? Oh, the other mic. I need a mic. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, St. Paul's Hello. University, for doing this. Thank you for inviting me here. It's the first time I'm visiting your, your campus. So thank you. Um, so what we're going to do, we're here to talk about creative expression. We're here to celebrate it. We're here to talk about the practice of writing. And we have in our midst... Um, sorry, some housekeeping there. Um, so what we, what we have here, I'll just say for the benefit of the professors, we have students of language and literature. We have students of life. We have very accomplished literary critics. But what tickles me more is to know that we have a few writers who've published one or two things, but we also have a few people who would like to write, but they are afraid. So this is your moment to catch some wisdom from two very accomplished um, creative writers. But I also need to say, that the conversation we're going to have here today is not just from creative writers, which the two professors are, they are also very accomplished literary critics. As people who talk about the meaning of creative expression, the merits of the text, and so on. So we will draw from all of those resources uh, in the course of this conversation. I don't want to believe that there's anybody in this audience who hasn't read a single poem sentence. Is there? Just in case, and you're shy to admit it, let's set the mood by asking the two professors to do some reading for us, so that we familiarize ourselves with what they write, how they write, just the sound of it, yeah? The play of words and so on. Is that okay? We can start with some reading. What I also would like to ask, just say a few words, and then read, yeah? Okay, we'll do that. Um, let me do this because I'm between father and son. 
and I actually happened to fall down in the middle there because Professor Kobe is my mother's agent. No, 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 sit where you are. I'm happy with you where you are. You won't fall. <laughs> but more seriously, uh, Professor Kobe actually was born in the same year as my mother, so I really feel he is my father. And Mukoma here is my little brother. Now don't worry, I don't actually have any little brother, so I won't put him in. <laughs> but I will ask that since you're my younger brother, can I go today, to avoid confusion, call me Mokoma when I ask the questions, and refer to that here as Pope. Is that okay? <laughs> I would not be comfortable with my mother's yeah, yeah. Let, Let's do this. Let's ask Professor to move to the podium there and say a few words and probably give us a meeting, please. Yeah. I'll say a few words. Maybe from here and then move to the podium. Thank you. Now, let me also ask the audience one hmm? thing. I know your cell phones are off hmm? or in silence, and let's remind you to the incident. So that you do not interrupt the flow of the reading. And secondly, when Professor finishes his reading, please hold your applause. Don't clap at that point. Please let Mukoma do his reading and then you clap at the end. It's my clever little way of making sure we don't know who the favorite is here. <laughs> just come. Uh, Watch out. I just want to express my gratitude for the invitation. Okay, yeah. sir, sir. Uh, it kind of connects me very much to you. The remote room, the place that means so much to me and my educational uh, career and to my family. So I'm very grateful to St. Paul for making this possible. And of course, we don't consider fight <laughs> for Mokoma Wago in making it you know, uh, possible. Uh, but I want to start by just thanking a few people and who are here in the audience. There are so many people. So if I don't mention you, it's simply because you have, you have very, very many of you. Uh, but I thought I'd better get this out of the way. You know, um, Of course, there's Professor Gar Gar Garlo, the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Irongo, uh, the organizers who have been very wonderful, uh, uh, Davula, you know, uh, but I want to mention a few people who are here. First, I want to start with my family, uh, because they've been so inspiring to me. And I start with the older one. Uh, T, or Theong Ngoge, are you here? Yes. Or is he, can you stand up, please? You know, uh, <clears throat> he's, a, he's the author of the book of short stories, Seasons of Love and Despair. Uh, He's also a musician, a very shy musician, I think. <laughs> and he has composed uh, some songs, and he inspired me enough to start learning the piano at the age of, well, a few years ago. Kimunya <laughs> Wagwe, is he here? No, he is not here. Uh, but area, uh, he's working, yeah. He thinks the writers don't work, so he went to work, <laughs> yeah. Um, all my family, I have four, there are four of them are published writers. Theong uh, Gugi, of course, I would mention him because he's, today we are dwelling with him. <laughs> but the others, his sister, Wajiko Gugi, and uh, with uh, the four of saints, and uh, Dosho, I said murders, yeah. So they inspire me a lot. Uh, and all the others. But I also mentioned a few guests who are here, really, whom I want to, because I don't want to forget. There's one person I want to mention here, particularly, Wairimo Wago Gemirie Ewoko. Wairimo. Wairimo Wago Gemirie. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you talking about? Why you want to introduce? Why do I hold it? Why you know? Why you know? Ah, why go go and meet? 
ni umwe ale amakire kamere ogori muga kamere zo na ngai ka deda uyo no we ware gitwe ke horo cio kwaje na koina eh no igwa ah na ni we ningi mutumia wa ngogi wa mirie wa twa dikri da kruna kere ngai ka deda na rere ngogi wa mirie arutori a leme da kurago ekedu kiwe to ni sisara roko lema tumete Patrick Shaw, kwa gogi wa amiri gara riga maka mura ge. Gwe ne ahoti eko kora na age vie Zimbabwe. Maja maki wae wa ilimu na ke age vie kuo. Mune motu miya wa ake. Mage vie kuo. Na mare ona ku Zimbabwe. Mate ya tigiri horo wa kamere zo. Madhira maya kamere zo ege Zimbabwe. Kwa wa zimbabwe ne agu ne kire mono ni odo wao okoro me zibabwe okay ningo wai mune mo yiri mono eh nyebo shio shia kire na wai na ta wai na ga shio shia ka mire do no ya ga mono eh wai yiri mo ya ah ngo wa mire ni etiruo eh na de na ma hale ya ale aratwe no guo na kuna murari horo wa thiomi ake na mono leke gote ro gena ihenya ale me guko Kimanu wa jogu, ego ko. Okay, di kwa limo shiaku, ngozo karaoke, ego ko. Okay, oh, oh, I have. Sorry, did I switch back to the koyo? When? Oh, oh, ah, fole, fole, siku. Ilifanyika hivi hivi yo. Si, oh, okay. I said, let me mention a few other guests. When I talk about Wairimo, did I say I'm Nige Koyo? Nige Koyo. Nige Koyo. Okay. It shows you where my... Heart is really in terms of African languages, not just Kikuyu, but in terms of African languages. But let me mention a few others who have been uh, pivotal in the promotion of African languages. And one of them, Kimani Jogu, is he here? Yes, sir. Yeah, please, yeah. I worked with him. We were together at Yale University and other places, and we have talked African languages over and over and again. Even now, at, at North California, I'm emailing him all the time, so we keep in touch, you know. Let me just press a good karaoke, is he here? Uh, I have to ask him to please give me a bit of his beard, because mine, is, <laughs> mine has never grown beyond. Godo <laughs> karaoke, <laughs> thank you for your services, yeah. Uh, let me mention one, one more. I'll not mention all of you, but Peter Nyoro, who edited my book, Adamo Yuru. Very, I know it was very hard work, but he did a brilliant you know, job. You know. There are many others who are here. But before we do, before I do that, I just want to say thank you. First of all, to all our musicians in all African languages, you know, because they have really kept our languages live, you know. I would mention all their names, but all African musicians have been very, very wonderful. But I want to mention one special guest because I was not really expecting her here tonight. And I want her to stand up. She's a gospel singer, or she used to be a gospel singer. But now she, oh, wait, let me mention her name. Lucy Mogambi, are you here or did you go? Where is she? Oh, please, can you let people see your face? Because I'm going to tell where they can find it. Huh? Yes. That's, yeah, I've seen her films in the cool language, and really, the level of camera work, the editing, the relevance, and the act is really very wonderful. Even if you understand the koyo, please look at her YouTube. Just put Kanyanya stars, 
and you see actually some of the, uh, you know, acting really b brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Like your your film, Cinema Husband. What's the name? Ah, uh, it's like But all of them, you know. I mean, you know, they are really every. So I'm very thankful that you are able to make it to this tonight. And now, having done that out of the way, and if I not to mention anybody, please, like some Bure and others, please know that uh, uh, I'm aware of you, but time now tells me that I should stop avoiding the inevitable, the duel between me and my mother newer son, <laughs> Mukoma or Prof. Mukoma Wagugi. Okay. So I'll go and do the reading first. Although you're not to applaud, but please applaud, it, applaud in your heart. And, <laughs> and applaud for me. Okay. Right? <laughs> in your heart, that is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll read from this, but I'll need a little bit of help. Can I read from there? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Twa di aga to kenete, to ga shoka to kenete, rogendo rohalero, to ge di na to ge shoka, to rohalero ga to ge di na to ge shoka. Can I have the mic? Oh, the whole thing was to have this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So please. Easier to turn the page. Yeah. Yeah, we'll improvise. I'll go. Okay. 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 The first epic, I believe, in Iko language. An epic is a long sort of narrative in a uh, vast form. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it's also my first attempt at an epic. And I call it Kedamoyeru, or in English, I shall be calling it the perfect nine. Right. I want to tell you a little bit about the perfect nine. <clears throat> the Gikoyo people say that. Uh, can you help? Uh, is that okay? Continue. Continue. Okay. Uh, he's whispering to me, telling me, you know, don't tell them the secret. Just tell me alone, but I'll, I'll defy him.
You can clap for him now. <laughs> the Kikuyu people say that their founder was the Koyo and Mombi, man and woman. Okay, and God somehow put them, brought them to the top of. Hello. Testing, testing. <laughs> hello, hello, can you hear me? Oh, great, yeah. I'm sorry, but I like using my hands a lot, so I hold one mic, makes, I feel like I'm tied, okay? Anyway, let me tell you about, <clears throat> they had nine daughters. Uh, and the nine daughters, actually there were ten, but they say nine, uh, but they are ten. So when they say they are ten, they say keda moyuru, uh, but otherwise they say keda nine, keda moyuru ten, okay? Uh, and they, are, they make the nine, ten clans of the Gikuyu people. Every Gikuyu person belongs to one of the ten clans, okay? Right. But I was always bothered. I'm sorry, I don't offend anybody, but I was always very bothered by description of our clans. There was a never negativity all the time, even when you feel very proud of their clans, you know. Uh, they would say, oh, that clan has witches or something. It's, you know, it's very good with witchcraft. Uh, that clan sold a child for, uh, or whatever. I mean, very negative things. It's bothered for a long time, but I did not know what to do about it. Until sometime in the, at the University of California, Irvine, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, I had, I realized this. Those 10, girls or women did not have any brothers, okay? So really, literally, there's one man and 11 women. So those girls had to do everything. They must have known, and they must have known how to build, how to make things, right? They must have known how to make weapons to defend themselves. So they must have made weapons Okay? They must have known how to hunt everything. And they must have known how to plan, use their mind. And I felt like a revelation, literally. And in fact, I thought this was, wait a minute. These are actually the original feminists, right? <laughs> so one night, literally, I woke up and started writing the epic, and it says, generally, I'll give you a, bit, a brief outline. Uh, the nine daughters, or ten daughters, were born in the, in the shadow of Mount Kenya. Oh my God, they were so beautiful. You know, and certain nine ostriches left, rode on the waves of the wind like horses with the trumpets. These they are big as trumpets talking about their beauty. Okay. And wherever young men were, were in the continent, each would see the beauty in their dreams and each would wake up to pursue this dream of beauty in their minds or their, in their, in the beauty in their dreams. They would follow the rivers whatever was the nearest river, but then they found other young men had similar ideas pursuing this beauty. They followed the major rivers of the continent uh, towards the mountain of the moon or the mountain of ostrich whiteness, what we call Mount Kenya. 
Some fell on the wayside, others this. So only 99 passed, came to the, to, uh, the home of Rikoyo and Mombi. Now, remember there are 10 women, 99 men. Rikoyo tells, and Mombi tells them now, now you have to prove who you are, testing. Yeah? You go back to the mountain and bring me each some handful or whatever in a gourd of that moon whiteness that's on Mount Kenya, bring it home. At the same time, I want something else. Let me explain. The ninth daughter, who normally is not hardly mentioned in a myth, is called Warigia. And she, she's born without firm legs, okay? So she is, um, how shall I say, grown woman, except for the legs. But there's a cure for her. And the cure lies in a hair that cures all, and the hair grows in the middle of the tongue of a man eating ogre, okay, right? And something more, the ogre actually is invisible, <laughs> except for the tongue occasionally, like when it comes to capture any of them. So this is a task they are given, but the girls are not left behind, they go with them. They'll go through whatever difficulties they come through, they'll be part of the challenges they meet on the way, okay? Of course, you're going to read the rest for yourself in this. But let me tell you, again, they were uh, mothers or matriarchs of the nine clans of the good people. And have you have heard of them, Dongi? Some of them. Oh, can you tell us a little bit about one of them, maybe? Uh, can you come here? Sure. Okay. Um, Is there a one boy here? Oh, one boy, right here. Huh? Okay. One boy. Yes. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. One boy. You know, one boy. One boy. Okay. The clan, okay, one, okay, the clan of our boy. What do they say about the clan of our boy? Our boy, you know, our boy. At the moment, boy, era go, era go, di liye kahe jahe ne ngara gumwari mo. Ne go jigu aga. Hey, asha. Wa boi aga to mire kage dere a doirio he de angaragu kage sho kana kio do ke yoru jahe ma ho na makira na kahe kio do ngongo mukwa kio ngo takaire tu na tuwa ho na kai ne makahe na kaire tu gotire otange hono kia bororie on baka kio do agitara ga jata. Amenye me viere a de o de. No a boy ne moara. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. A to ngori diye boto, en ongo ine wa wa boy me re do. Nyame shore. Wa boy nyame shore. Eh? Nemo me oi. Zebra. Aha. Zoyon no wo. Hey. Nyame shore eke henia we ruine. No matimona hiyo. Ze magedara. Hey. Hey, <laughs> 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 Oh, she knew our boy. 
One of the daughters was called Wangari. Kuna Wangari hapa? Ah, right there. Oh, yes. Uh, this one is dedicated to you. Uh, Wangari. Nina wa Angari. Muhereka, muhe, nyaji erige. Hey, no, gari erige. Matiro karo ma. Wa Angari. Nina wa Angari. Muhereka wa ke ogogo kaga okauga. Avo Angari ito e. Hey, hey. Wa Angari e oro meta wa Angari. Na maizo ma ke uderi o taguo. Hey, ina ke. E metoke ta ya Angari. Akira angira otari, akira angoni aria mari. Na ne muara, ate lidiye weira, aduma ambe mahone doma. Mauro kera makeo rutana hinya, na keo na wendo. Aike ilie garege shingai. Yona adhade liera ine, ekiora na shiombori ike honoka. Oiga ga garadi si ya konora me siria ne inoro le amuoyo. No garadi si ya konora hiyo ne inoro le yake kuo. Wangari ne kiro le roa. Ate kwe moana ke wa tu ire ahumbiri te guoko. Moari mo haria aga idiri yone wangari. Ate orugari ushio. Doka na nyuo ne liwa. Okay, I think I had I had said that their father and mother were Giko and Mombi, and although we say that they were brought there by God, because of Giko, people never say they did things by them. They always say, "God helped me do this. God made me come to the mountain." So. Uh, but in my narrative, they must have come from elsewhere, but came to the mountain, but they don't say, I brought myself to the mountain. They say, God, you know. And they were, oh my God, when they, uh, page three, oh yes. Okay. Page uh, that, oh yes, okay, oh yeah, yeah, oh yes. When they came to the top of the mountain, they saw the beauty of the land in front of them, and were totally, that's how they knew they had got to the right place. And that's why they said God brought them there, because the, the beauty of the land was absolutely mesmerizing, and they simply fell into a song, or they broke into a song. <laughs> Nyo dako yo wakenga take teri oyo jo ana ire manyinge ona nyamu mithemba minge maho wa maya eriri waku mete na nyamu hamwe na nyoni na jongo yo jo ine na ndia ine Shiumbe shiothe, niri waku, tuwa dhikereria, tuwa igua mugambo. Wakunga yo, kiuotha koyo wothe, watu wathena, tura matewega. Kiro lerwa, niri waku mwega, reke, kiro lerwa, niri waku mwega. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you want to read more about the clans and all your clan and what happened to all that, of course, the book is selling outside, I believe. Kedamo eh? Yuru. It will eventually be translated into English and that is a perfect nine. And I'm, I understand there is a translation about to go into operation, into Kip Kipsigis? Kipsigis. And I, so we might actually see it translated to other African languages before the English one or at about the same time. And Kiswahili, I hope. Thank you.
since I'm taller, somebody might have to adjust the mic. <laughs> I was trying to make fun of his height, but you guys missed the joke. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, while I was sitting there, uh, Dr. Joyce Nyarov asked me a note to say that, uh, that Fafa cheated in the duel because he brought somebody on stage to help him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so as, you're thinking, as you're thinking about who is winning, keep that in mind. Some of us are not playing fair. So <laughs> I, on the other hand, have only my pen. Uh, anyway. So let, let me begin by thanking uh, SPU uh, and, of course, to Dr. John Davula, you know, who really, you know, and, and, and of course the powers that be here, you know, but it's Dr. Davula who really made my visit possible and all the connections and networking and so on and so forth. Uh, and, of course, also to Dr. Joyce Nyairo uh, for agreeing to moderate. Um, if you, yeah, she wrote this. Um, it was a review of my brother T's book. Uh, it's called the, the Goges Jukebox Dance. I don't know, that, that stayed with me, you know, the idea of, you know, because it turns on in all our writing, you know, the Goges and all their writing. We all have a jukebox. I don't know why, you know, but um, for, those, for, those, for those of you interested in writing and psychology, that would be a, a, a good start. Um, yeah, also, I wanted to say it also means a lot for me to be here in Limuru. Um, I grew up in Getogo, about 15 minutes from here. Uh, I went to Tigoni Primary School. I uh, went to Genia Secondary School, then went to Kanunga. So, you know, yeah, in, in other words, I'm what you might call a local boy. Uh, but don't call me boy. Maybe, it's just, maybe just a local prof. <laughs> you know, yeah, and then also to be in Limuru also, and to be on this stage with my father, to share this stage with my father, and of course with my brothers and friends here as well. But also equally importantly, uh, with my wife here, Maureen Buck, Dr. Maureen Buck. She's a real doctor, and like, Fafa, who has honorary doctorates. <laughs> OK, I really enjoyed that one, I have to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, do, uh, Dr. Maureen Buck, and also my daughter, Nyaburua Mokama, who is named after, after my late mother. Um, so but let me begin. I want to, it, it, yesterday was Kimadi's uh, execution date, right? It was his uh, date of death. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, about all the things we don't know. First, we don't know where he was buried. What about our Kenyan history don't we know? And I've been, I'm, I'm writing a book now on uh, Africans and African Americans, and one of the surprising things that I've found uh, was that actually Malcolm X came to Kenya uh, in, the, in 1964, thereabouts. But he had also actually come into Kenya in 1959. But anyway, when he was here, he met with Pio Gama Pinto, who was a trade unionist, a, a, you know, a radical trade unionist. Uh, he's an Asian Kenyan. Uh, he also met with Jaramogi, met with, uh, with, uh, with President Kenyatta then. Then he went to Tanzania, he went to Zanzibar, met with the revolutionary Babu. But um, when he was in Kenya, he also gave a talk. Uh, he gave a speech at the Kenyan parliament. Now, I've been going around asking Kenyans, you know, how many of you know Malcolm X was in Kenya? By raise of hands, and, and don't raise your hand if you have heard it from me, because <laughs> I've been saying that a lot. But how many of you know Malcolm X was in Kenya? Yeah. All right, two, three. Yeah, so okay, five. Okay, let's say even ten. You know, to be generous, right? You know, so 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 I, I, I think there are very deep questions about what we we don't know where Kimadi was buried. We don't know the history of uh, of Malcolm X in Kenya. You know, and, and just to add quickly, the fascinating thing about Malcolm X and Pio Gama Pinto is that Pio Gama Pinto is that they were assassinated within four days of each other, right? You know, at any rate, there are all these questions we don't know about our Kenyan history, but I wanted to, be, to read a, a poem called A Collage of Death Masks uh, in, uh, in memory of Dead and Kimathi and all the revolutionaries, uh, thinkers and, you know, and, 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 and fighters and so on and so forth that we have lost over the years. Uh, a Collage of Death Masks, what I did was, I, I, I love biographies, so, you know, so I've, I read all their biographies and then extracted what I found was the most poignant uh, thing about them, right? You know, in some quotes I do word for word, others are me imagining them, right? Uh, a collage of death masks. Steve Biko. With our two hands, we ply open my chest for arrows, tips poisoned with black ink. I write what I like. Amilka Cabral. To peer past midnight, I have returned to the source. Che Guevara. Next door, a single gunshot announces my friend's death. Hours later, a key turns and I stand on my wounded leg. Shoot, coward. Your guillotine can only kill flesh, not what it dreams. Franz Fanon, we are nothing unless slaves to a cause. 
In my militant servitude, I find freedom. Ruth first. When I fell, it was only to go find Mondlane to tell him Mozambique was free and in Azania, freedom had begun to thaw. Gashi Aloka. In the distance between the bullet and my heart, I cannot remember the prayer my mother taught me. Tell her that her love negotiated this passage for me. Rosa Luxemburg. They keep drawing blood from the toiling oxen. Don't they know that death and democracy are infinite, that we each get ours in the end? Mondlane. I read Marx in struggle only to realize I was reading him a second time. Karemi Idudu. Possibility of life actualizes in the fact of freedom. I do not fear them or their death. Arthur Noje. This suicide, final plunge, this my last poem, will it erase appetite. Malcolm X. I do not see bullets or death hurtling toward me. I see truth, and if it fails to heal, then it can only kill. Cancer or Weaver. My blood soaking into the earth to heal its wounded limbs. My libation. Wayaki. In my future, I see Kemadi always on his feet, arm in arms. Um, let me read you a poem. There's a time um, I'm very much interested in the question of African languages, and more specifically, uh, translating between African languages, right? Um, so I started taking classes in, uh, in uh, Isinkosa uh, in sometime in the 2000s, and while I was taking the classes, I wrote a poem called Isitandwa. So I'll read it in uh, Isinkosa and, uh, and then read your translation. Uh, unlike some of us. <laughs> yeah, no, Papa made it too easy. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, isitandwa. Yeeza ngapa isitandwa, na mklanje kushushu. Yeeza isitandwa wam, gomso kuzi ya polile. Yeeza isitandwa, nifuna kukubulisa buliso nyingi. Gomso kuyambandile nati. Isitandwa, utetantoni, unantoni, masiteta. Ekaya ni ekaya. Ndiza kupinda, ekaya ni ekaya. Umamela kakulu kuleiti isitandwa. Sikona, masia, ekaya. Uh, home is home. My dear, walk to me. It is hot today, but tomorrow will be cool. My dear, come to me. I want to ask you a question. What will tomorrow bring? What do you say? What is it with you? Speak. Home is home. Repeat after me. Home is home. Listen well. We are here. And it is late now. Let us go home. Uh, thank you. I must respond to that one. Uh, oh, yeah, I can see. He said, unlike some. Uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to name names either. <laughs> so, my challenge is you, you look just in. Yeah, it's closer. It's closer. Yep. Well, I'm going to do one in Luo. Yeah. <laughs> And furthermore, I'll go a step further. I'm going to teach them Luo in two minutes. Two minutes. Okay? In our Luo language, <coughs> when, we <laughs> <coughs> when you want to refer to me, I, is A. Okay? A. A. Correct? When you refer to, to you who is in front of me, it is E, like the one which begins with you, India. E, okay? You got me so far? When you to refer to him or her, is O, or O, O, like zero, okay? Is there a low speaker here? Is that so far? Right? So, if you know that, all you need to know is just a verb and fit it there. <laughs> <laughs> Say, for instance, you know what the we, which is to go or going. So, you say, yeah, are we? <laughs> e we? <laughs> or we? <laughs> okay.
You can even now play around with it. Say, Avidala. Oh, huh? Huh? Avidala. Or even Nairobi. Huh? Or the Kisumu. Huh? And now you can go on elaborating. Then you go to we, where, and I won't go into all that, but uh, I don't teach you one. <laughs> when I went to Kisumu, I said I must, I mean, I'm going to talk rural language spoken here, I must also, you know. So what the book we are uh, celebrating is a book published by East African Education Publishers, and it's called Somo Bear, okay? Somo Bear. So I thought, Somo Bear? A song that I found in my mind. Somo Bear, Diko Bear. And if you have the copper, some are bear, the sumoma bear. Okay? And you have the sumoma bear, Kenya, my bear. And you have Kenya, my bear, Africa, so, some bear. So it goes like this some more bear. You guys say, some more bear, the other side you can say, the copper. Kiss more bear, Kenya bear. And then all of us, Africa, my bear. Okay? So remember, if I say Somo, Somo bear, the other side says, Kiss more my bear. All of us, Africa. Let's try it. We shall end up becoming real speakers in two. <laughs> okay? We just say Somo. Bear. Africa bear. Therefore, some bear. Huh? Got it? Well, okay, not too bad, but um <laughs> huh? Please let us know if you um, hear us. We're trying to share a mic here. Just so can you hear us okay? No. You can't? Okay. So I was trying to free their hands so that they could fight yeah. properly, but that's oh. okay. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. My hand is tight. That's why. <laughs> that's why he's losing the fight. Uh, uh, no. This, um, <laughs> this, my daughter, my son, they are biased against, they are gang against me. <laughs> It's intergenerational now. No, we won't do that. Um, you know, there's a really important point that they have just raised, uh, particularly Prof here, about language and culture and the need to not only battle for the right to your own culture, but to have a responsibility to learn about the culture of the other person, yeah? But we're not going to get into that right now. I want to start in a slightly different place. Um, because I think I had Prof say something about writing at night. So I want to ask, because you're amongst family, you're at home, your secrets are safe here. Is there something that most people don't know about the way you write? Like, is there a particular t-shirt that you have to wear to write? Do you write lying down? Like, what's that thing? What's that habit that you have cultivated over time that always works for you as a writer? Prof, shall we start with you? Let me hear what he is going to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As you can see, I was so generous, I was giving him the microphone. Mm -hmm. Again, keep that in mind. Um, and I, I want to make a joke and say I'm like Bruce Lee, you know, not to make him scared of the duel. But in, in terms of being so good at everything that I don't have one specific way of doing it. Okay, okay I'm joking now, anyway. <laughs> no, the only thing I can think of is I tend to to write in one space for maybe intensely for maybe a month, and then I exhaust that space. So I have to keep moving. I have to keep moving to different spaces. Um, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm not the sort of disciplined writer who will say, I'm going to write from six to nine and so on and so forth. So I write in uh, intense bursts of, of, of energy. Yeah, so yeah, yep. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything special I wear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in a sense, I'm like that a little bit. I don't have a, a writing hours. I don't sort of say from six to seven. Uh, it depends on my mood. But the mood, if I get a very interesting idea, like when I wrote uh, Kedamoyuru, I could write 
whenever I've got time. I mean, that was between my teaching, if they find a little bit of space, I can go and write. The other thing is, when, when I, I'm, I get used to a play, if, I, if at my home I sit on a particular chair, when I begin to write, I, no matter what I do, I have to keep on sitting on that chair. Or if it's facing a particular side of the house, I find myself always you know, doing the same for the duration of that you know, uh, work. Uh, but in terms of time, I remember when I was writing um, uh, Wizard the Crow, which took me about 10 years to write. But I was really obsessed with the novel, so much so that I even began enjoying waiting at airports because it gave me space. And one time I missed my plane <laughs> at an airport because I was so engrossed in it. I was in Chicago, actually. I was so engrossed in it that I lost count of time and went to the wrong gate. And yeah, uh, so it really, it really depends on what I'm writing. Yeah, but I don't have the discipline of waking at six o'clock and doing it. But when I'm in the mood, I can even wake up in the middle of the night and just write it. You know, I can script. I can be in a lecture like this, and if the idea has, I can find myself writing while also listening to the lecture. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think on that point, one of the writing discipline the same way. Eclectic. Any space will do. Any space can be exploited. Um, I'm not going to keep score as we go along. I'll ask you at the end to be the judge. Uh, Mukoma, I have a question for you specifically. When I go through the streets of Twitter, um, Kenyans on Twitter, I see an incredible amount of talent as far as wit is concerned, clever wordplay. Um, there's a fair amount of unworthy invective as well. But there's, there's certainly some creativity there uh, that I see from Kenyans on Twitter. And I wonder, do you, I don't know that you've paid as much attention to it, but do you think, given that wealth of talent, we are seeing as many Kenyan writers emerge as that talent suggests? Um, yeah, so at first I think it depends. I would, have, I would have to go back to the question of language, right? Uh, in fact, I wanted to highlight this as we were talking about you know, in the earlier section where this is by Professor Mahola who introduced, you know, introduced Fafa and I earlier. Uh, and the book is called God Speaks in Our Own Languages, right? And I've been going around and saying, you know, this is the most succinct uh, understanding of, of, of why we should, you know, be writing and thinking in our own languages. Because I, I keep making the joke, I mean, would you be chilling somewhere and then God come and speaks to you in Latin, right, or French or whatever, right? You know, so, so, so I, I think the question of what language. Now, when we did the last Mabati Kiswahili Prize for African Writing, we had 116 manuscripts, right? Uh, there was a time we had a, a, a policeman who won a Kenyan policeman who, won, who had been working on his novel for 20 years. So I actually beat him for the first 10 years of Wizard of the Crow. You know, yeah, so, you know, and sometimes I ask myself, okay, so, okay, who is a real writer? Is it that guy who is sitting there writing that novel in Kiswahili for 20 years with no hope of publication? Or is it me who has a literary agent? You know, I already have this connection. So, so there's a question of language, of what language are we talking about? Um, but I, I, I think people are writing. I, I, you know, I've, I've judged several, uh, you know, poetry, poetry, and um, and, and short, short fiction, you know, uh, contests. I, I, I think people are writing. We just need to increase more avenues for them to create. We need. I, I keep saying we need more of everything, right? We need more journals, literary prizes, uh, in all languages. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. But, but I, so, I, and also, I just wanted to add that I, that. And I'm not saying this is what you're asking, right? You know, but um, the idea that we don't have a reading culture, I, I think that's a myth. That we, because, yeah, because of Twitter, if you're Twitter, you, you know, you're reading Facebook, you know, you're writing some of it is terrible, but you're still writing and, 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 you know, and reading, yeah. 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 Uh, so what do you think, um, Prof? What is it that makes writing, you know, some clearly very talented people who never actually emerge as writers. And I think Mokoma has hinted slightly about institutions. Why? But why is writing also something that some people, no matter how they try and escape it, they will end up there regardless of what they were doing? What is it about this particular 
Shall I call it a vocation or shall I call it a job? How, how would okay. you like to describe so it? Going back to it, no, no. Yeah. It's, it's like, an, uh, sometimes it's like an obsession. I can't help it. And I know this, uh, first of all, let me say this. Uh, imagination is the greatest democratic equalizer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, imagination does not know PhDs or primary schooling, woman, man, child, you know, uh, we can create with our own imagination. And again, imagination is no respect of the father who read so many novels. Someone can write their first novel and becomes more readable, more interesting than the one who has been writing novels all his life, you know. Or like me, who wrote the river between in English, and even today people, when I meet people, they say that, oh, hello, great writer, whatever, I read you, <coughs> your river between. And I keep on saying, can they at least mention that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in other words, in Chinua Chebe, things fall apart. His first novel, in a way, is still the most outstanding novel but in his work, right to what he wrote later. You know, so imagination, you who are here, you know, each one of you has a book, okay? And you can write, that's gone. But it's also hard work. This is where the difference comes in, you know. I can work, even when, Remember my first four novels, five novels, I wrote longhand. We didn't have, but we had to keep, on, keep at it. Someone had read the whole man is all over again from beginning to end or whatever. So there must be that drive has to be there. When I went to, uh, when I was put in prison, aha, uh -huh. yes. Some of you don't know that, okay. I tell you, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I might do my job in California, <laughs> right? So, you know, I was once put in, uh, committed maximum security prison, eh? all because of the play, Guy Cardeda. Uh, Wairimo knows this because, as I said, Gouvan Marie, Patrick Shaw, the killer. Some of you may not, you young Jeremy not know him, but he was like a killer fellow here called Patrick Shaw. A Colombia, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, God can okay, bear witness that they had gone, they were waiting for Google Mary in his house, outside his house, and it happened that in a matato he was driving from Nairobi to his home in Garariga. They, he was told that Patrick Shaw is waiting for him. Okay, so he got back in the same matato, went back to Nairobi, and he went underground, reappearing in uh, Zimbabwe. So anyway, uh, in my case, it was after I was married when I want that I was put in. Gowamiri was put in, was being hunted after uh, Mother Singh for me, or my daughter Yugira, you know. I, uh, after Guy Gardena, and I was put in a maximum security prison, committed maximum security prison. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, what saved me, really, to survive a professor yesterday, <laughs> chairman of a chairperson of a department, well-known writer all over the world, you know, being in a prison cell, no books, no paper, no pen. <laughs> it was really, uh, in, uh, I know it's, it's, you're used to books all your life, and then you don't have it. I fell, it fell to my imagination in a way. It really helped me. Two things happened to my imagination. At some time, I realized I was breaking jail every single night. Right? Mm. It's amazing because I could visit home. Uh, I visited you at home, comma, <laughs> <laughs> to check whether your music, you know, the other I was checking on you and music and others, you know, uh, I would recall conversation we had had, then I would come back to prison, okay. Uh, I did so many things, you know, uh, and I realized imagination 
was making me break through the prison walls. And I felt such power that they cannot jail my imagination. Mm -hmm. It's something, almost a sensation that I felt. They cannot, the one thing they cannot do is uh, uh, imprison my imagination. The only thing they can do now is kill me. Otherwise, without killing me, and I've got imagination, I can break jail every time, okay? And that's when I start writing. And then, in the same prison, I start thinking about African languages and English and so on. And that's why actually when I made a decision to now start writing novels in the Koyo language. Okay, yeah. before we go to language, yeah. um, you know, you've raised a really important point there about the risks of writing, the risks of knowledge, um, and also you pointed out uh, one big difference, or is it an advantage Mokoma has? Yeah, technology? Mm -hmm. So he wrote longhand, you've never had to write longhand. So well, can we give the prize? Oh, no, sorry. hold it, hold it, not so fast. <laughs> 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 it depends on when I started writing, because when I started writing, we didn't have computers. I mean, you know, uh, I didn't see a computer until, uh, 1990, mm. and those were the old ones. Yeah. But, but fine, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, you, you grant him that? Well, begrudgingly. Yes. Begrudgingly, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I know that you mentioned it briefly when you were on the podium and, and you kind of tried to slide past it, but I'm still gonna ask this question because it's disturbed me for the longest time. Mm. There's this one scene that runs through the writing of all the gogis, whether we are talking about Wajiko, we are talking about uh, T here, mm -hmm. we're talking about dad, and we're talking about you. So the scene, it's a bar, a pub. <laughs> there's one of the characters who, there's music playing in the background, but one of the characters stands up, walks to the jukebox, puts in a coin, selects a song, and starts to dance. I miss it already. <laughs> You're missing that scene. Either dancing by the jukebox, usually dancing alone, but selecting a song and dancing. So, so this jukebox, is it that you people as a family own jukeboxes? Do you manufacture them? <laughs> Why does this trope keep coming up in all your writing? Oh. You can't avoid it now. You have to yeah. answer it. Yeah. That's, that's more common. And <laughs> yeah. I will remind you of the minutes of glory in Secret <laughs> yeah, Lives. They are not jukeboxes. <laughs> There was a jukebox in minutes of... Yeah, that's true. That's yeah, true. no, I mean, it, it, so, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, we, it, one of the things I loved was actually going to a bar, it, you know, of course, you know, I, I don't want to reveal the age I started going, uh, because my daughter is here. But anyway, it, but, 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 no, but really, but one of the things I loved was going to the... That, that whole process of, you know, you, you know, you have some coins, first you have to go get change, you know, from, 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 from the bartender, then... You know, then you select, then you spend some time going through the, you know, th those are the days when you have to flip them, right? And then you find the song and you're trying to read the mood of the bar, then you select the perfect song and then sometimes people would get up and dance. But um, so, so, so that, that aspect of it, but the whole idea of music as well, but that physicality of it, I love that. But um, there, was a, there was a friend of mine who, is now, who has now passed away. Uh, he was a South African court where seas were, a freedom fighter. Um, and he was in exile in, uh, I believe, in Angola. So, and you're telling me this story one day about how he went to a bar, right? And, you know, he played some music, and uh, the bartender, who was a woman, you know, came and they danced, and they, they said they danced for hours, they didn't talk. Um, you know, and then, and then they just parted ways. Yeah. You know, yeah, and I think in a lot of ways, any time I'm thinking about music, uh, any time I'm writing about the jukebox or music in general, I'm trying to understand that conversation they were having. Yeah. Yeah, music. I think. I think. I think. They, I, can, <clears throat> I know what. I know music runs in my family, but not from my side of the family. At least not me from me, you know. And but, we just had we just had him sing, but he's yeah, not a musician. But, yeah, okay. but their mother, Nyambura, was actually a very good singer. Came from a family of singers, so there's a kind of uh, something that runs through the music. The uh, uh, here is actually a pretty good composer, a shy one, I admit, but uh, a composer, you know, all the same. When they were children, one of the children I've never, I've never forgotten is a student they composed as children about a person who is bringing water. We didn't have water then in our house, in Getogobi, 
So we asked somebody with a donkey to bring the water. We, you know, and we kind of bought water. And they composed a song. Something. Correct, <laughs> Leo? <laughs> no, but they did as a children. It's a very, very, it's stayed in my mind. Let me put it this way. For me, it's stayed in my mind. I'm not, the, I'm not the composer, but I stayed in my mind. Okay. Uh, during Gahika, I can bear witness to this. Um, some of the best melodies in Gahika Deda were melodies actually composed by Thiongo. I gave him the words, he put a completely new melodies, and they were very, very beautiful. Uh, Kimunya also gave me words, and he called another melody. They were some of the most outstanding melodies in Gahika Deda. So, what I'm saying, it's kind of a running theme, you know, my, my, my family. Me, I can hear music in my head, but it's a problem. <laughs> when it tries to come out of my mouth, I know what happens, you know. Uh, and now I've started at 70 years of age. I enrolled in piano classes, you know, so I've been playing the piano a little bit, you know, but even then, no tune can. <laughs> well, the important I thing. Play, I can only play that which is on paper. I can mm -hmm. read music and play, but I cannot sort of create even the simplest tune that they're able to do. So there is that element. Mm. But having said that, let me just say this about music and rhythm. Actually, music and rhythm is in all our lives. You just watch people actually walking. And sometimes I, at University of California, I sometimes stand, sit, in a, and just watch people walking. Because I realize people are walking rhythmically. People are walking musically, yeah? right? Yes, you see there, you can some uh, one beat, another uh, to make the same, they make two of them. Uh -huh. So you get a full note, uh, half notes, quarter notes <laughs> and so on, you know, when they are walking. Mm -hmm. And then you look at their combination. And it's really very, very in interesting. You try and watch people here outside, you'll see they are walking musically. <laughs> Mokoma, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was going to say, um, yeah, so I, I have a novel that's coming out uh, with Cassava Republic Press called uh, We Sing the Tizzy Tattoo and Bury Our Dead. And it's all about, um, Okay, if, if you don't know Tizita music, uh, just go to YouTube and Google Tizita. It's a form of Ethiopian music. Um, it's more like blues, right? But it's more about, it's, it's almost as if the musicians are fighting about the soul of, of, of Ethiopia, right? It's, you know, and nobody can tell you exactly what it means, but when you listen to it, you can feel it. Yeah, so, so, so in that novel, um, I have four musicians who are competing to see who is the best Tizita, Tizita musician. Yeah. So the remarkable thing here that you're both saying, um, if I understand you correctly, uh, you know, when you're a creative person, the intertextuality, it's writing, yeah. it's music, it's yeah. sound, yeah. you're also an observer okay. of life, yeah. Um, yeah. like the people watching you've yeah. just described and the kind of thoughts that, yeah. that run through. Yeah. And so we will be talking about language, but the other important thing you've said here is that music is also a language. Yeah, if I understood you correctly. Um, let me ask, um, we've, you know, we've talked a little about writing practices of writing, habits of writing. Let's also talk about mentoring, because when you get to a certain stage in life, um, particularly when success uh, is around you, mentoring becomes part of what you do. So if we could just talk a little about that. Uh, I'll start with you, Mokoma. You know, in the lottery of life, life in some ways is a lottery, okay? So you found yourself the son of an incredibly successful creative writer. And you grew up with an oh, immense, <laughs> give him credit where it's due, please. Um, you know, not just the son of an incredibly cre uh, successful creative writer, but also you grew up with the privilege of books around you. It is a privilege. 
Sometimes when we talk about privilege, we think about money in the pocket, but let's talk about the other privileges that we have. So you grew up with books all around you. That's something that your father gave to you. You did not earn it. You did not apply for it. It's the lottery of life. What's the one thing that you would say your father has gained from the fact of you being a writer? That because you became a writer, there's something magical that happened in his writing, in his creativity. Is there, or did, did you just take, did you give? Oh, well, but he's the one who should answer that. <laughs> no, I want to hear it from you. <laughs> yeah, I mean. She's your sister, remember? Oh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. yeah. But okay, so as I think about that, let me address the, the first part of your question, right? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And the reason why I've come to think about the absence of structures, right? The absence of structures is that I understand my, my own upbringing and how lucky I was there yeah, to be surrounded by books. You know, I keep saying, when I sat down and said I wanted to write a, a, a book, I had no doubt. Like, I, there's a time I attempted a memo at 14, you know. Yeah, so, <laughs> of course, it was very short. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but even then, you know, like, I never had any doubt I could sit down and write a book because I was seeing it being done, right? I grew up reading Richard Wright, I mean, even, even from a very young age, because I read whatever I could in the house. Mm. Yeah, so, so that's how I ended, ended up thinking about, okay, so for me, I had, I could see the, I don't know, the stairway to the book, so to speak, right? But for most people, uh, and some of the questions I get talking of mentoring, some of the questions I get, uh, it, they tell me that that person doesn't have a, a ladder between their dream and the actual book, right? You know, so, so, so in that sense, I understand the privilege. Um, but for us to... It, it has, it, but for us to create those, that ladder, it has to be a collective, it has to be a collective effort, right? You know, because I'm talking about, uh, you know, I mean, in, um, for example, my daughter's school right now, right? You know, she's, she's eight years old, she's taking a nap as I talk, <laughs> <laughs> understandably. But I think in her school, they do some form of creative writing, right? Around them, you know, they have little magazines and so on and so forth. The, the little town we have probably has more magazines than, you know, literary magazines that, that, than in Kenya, for example, right? So, so we have to create those structures. Um, anyway, to answer your question, I, I would like to believe I've made my father a better writer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I, can't, I can't think of a single, um, you know, of a single instance, yeah. But, you know, but we exchange manuscripts, you know, yeah. you know, like we talk about writing all the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually we do discuss a lot, you know, our writings generally, and, and uh, I personally get, first of all, I get, as a writer, I get inspired by the fact that I have four published writers. Yeah, and, and can somebody check to see if we can win the Guinness Book of Records? Because now there's five of us who are published. <laughs> no, really, somebody really needs to look into that. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you about the Kibera family because I don't want to break your heart. And the last oh. two, <laughs> and the last two, of, you know, of my kids, you know, are also, you know, so they're, there's one who is very, very good. He's called Thiongo, like Thiongo. You know, yeah, yeah, TK, uh, he's T, yeah. and he writes very, very well, you know. Uh, he's very talented, uh, but he needs to put more work, you know. You know, I get they freely pass on their manuscript to me, not to correct them, yeah. like I also do exchange my manuscript to them. Because when I'm writing, oh my God, for me, I don't know about other people, I do really care that somebody can give me even five minutes, I don't mind, to listen to what I'm saying. Because there's always a doubt, you know. I may write 10 books, but the next one, there's always that element of doubt, uh, all the time, you know. And sometimes you may need somebody, your partner, your son, or sort of treat, us, treat to them and then they say something. It may be me, a comment about not what it's not working, which really energizes you, you know. So, to, so I feel very privileged, really, as a father and as a writer, you know, uh, to have you know all these, you know, uh, uh, really, you know, um, around me. And I feel very privileged when they let me instead of shying away from showing me their manuscript. Sometimes they show me, you know, and I comment or something. Uh, I mean, it's it's a nice kind of, you know, uh, yeah. literally uh, relationship that I really yeah, value. Can I add something quickly? Uh, it's very essential, you're talking about mentoring. So, uh -huh. so I, I think for writers, no matter how many books you have, as, as, as Fafa is saying, 
you know, that doubt is always there. Personally, I agree with Mark saying that, um, you know, that you're only, as next, you're only as good as your next book, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, there was something I read a while ago, I could never find, I, I never found this source, but it was somebody who was saying that a writer is half confidence, half doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and it works very well. The doubt will keep you pushing yourself to become better. The confidence will help you not bury your own writing, you know, be scared of showing it and so on and so forth. So you need to strike a balance. Don't let one overcome the other. Yeah. No, that, that's actually remarkable, yeah, that's you know, um, remarkable in terms of that advice to those who would like to write, but also that admission of what it feels like yeah. to be a writer, the amazing community of practice that you have within the family. And, and Prof, you did something remarkable the other day, speaking of mentoring, um, with the support of the Gota Institute in Nairobi. You spent half an afternoon the other day speaking to young Kenyan writers, uh, yeah. Kenyanjui, Kombani, uh, Gloria Monige, who wrote in the papers and t shared with us on Saturday what oh, she learned from you? you. Was it him or me? It was you. <laughs> oh, okay. that's, the, that's the way Gloria wrote it. Oh. And I believed her. At, you at you spent, did you, did you meet Kinyanjui Kombani, one of our writers, and, and Gloria? I, I think so. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. yeah? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In Karen. Oh, in Karen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's why. Oh, sorry. The with point. the support yeah, of the Gota right. Institute yes, in Karen. Yes, yes, so so yeah. you spent some time with these young yes, writers. Yes. And the kind of thing that you're saying, yeah. that sometimes as a writer, all you need is somebody to give you five minutes yeah. to listen to you, to share the experience. But I want to ask that question from a slightly different direction. What did you learn from those young writers, those young Kenyan oh. writers? <laughs> First of all, let me say, I, especially those who write in African languages, they really inspire me, you know. I'm surfing through, either, uh, through the uh, YouTube, mm. you know. And I found there are very many schools that are now uh, writing or sing poetry in a core language, you know. And I, I'm, you know, always very, very inspired, you know, uh, by that. There's one called Kihe Morafeti, I think, eh? yeah. And I saw it on uh, I saw him on uh, on the on YouTube, and I but there was a telephone number there, and I called him, and his mother who answered, you know, and I just felt I want to connect with this person, just to say how much I appreciate what they were doing, really, uh, because in some ways it's a collective thing, you know, it's individual I know, mm. but you get do get inspiration from what, uh, yeah. The other day, a good example is um, when I talked to the guild, was a literary guild, I can't remember, the yeah, editors, you know. And there was a young writer who has published a, a, a poetry book on his own in Igekoyo. Uh, it's karaoke somewhere, I think. Uh, but. I'll get the name right somehow or other. And he brought this book, which is published in Igikoyo. And I was even have almost very touched when he said that his first publication of his poetry was in an online journal I edit called Motiri, uh, which you can find in Motiri, www material.com, okay? Uh, there's very good poetry there by various peoples and so on. So when he came and showed it to me, his own book, his own, I was very, very excited by that, you know? So I do learn a lot from uh, efforts of uh, other people. And as I said, I do learn from my kids. Mm. When they're very excited about something they are doing, you know, I feel not simply because they are my sons and daughters, but there's something good about another writer or creative artist trying to do something, you know. Yeah. I get inspiration from Kenyan musicians, mm -hmm. particularly in African languages. Mm -hmm. The other day I was surfing through the YouTube, and there's a little lady singer. I thought her voice was magical. I didn't follow what she was saying. Yeah. But her voice was magical. I've been looking up I'll go back to the YouTube and look her up and so on, yeah. Because I like to get inspiration. Let me talk about one more inspiration, please. Sure. Because it's very, very important people do know this, you know. Um, 
First of all, uh, two people, and they happen to be here. I mentioned, very, I'll be very brief about this. Uh, is this Halima Gekandi? Yes. Yeah, Halima Gekandi. She's always in disguises. And so, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, Halima Gekandi is the daughter of one of the leading, literary leading, literary intellectuals in America. And Gekandi was one of the people who edited my first uh, Gekuyo language novels when he was working with Haina, with the East African Education Publishers. So whenever I meet him now, I will say thank you. You know, because of what he did then, he gave attention to, uh, he gave all he, he could to Gekuyo language editing and so on. Let me just mention another one here, Moses Kiloro. Can you please stand up, Moses Kiloro? I hope we shall talk a little bit about translation, but I want to mention this. This young man, he's working with a group called Jalanda, the collective. And they decided to focus on translation, to bring one translation issue, okay? Uh, African to African language trans trans translation issue. And you can Google it as, uh, well, she will give you the link, yeah? Okay. But let me say, he contacted Mokoma, said, can you ask your father please whether he can give us uh, a story in Igekoyo original so they can get the project going. I did not have a story then but in my box somewhere, there's a story I'd written for my daughter, Mombi, okay, called in English, The Upright Revolution, but in Ikoyo it's called, you know, Itui Kare Amoro Garo, Kana Kriage Tomaga Adoma Die Maro Gie, okay? So I give the English version, you know, in, in fact, uh, well, anyway, he, the story has now been translated up to now, or he can tell us more about it, into 78 languages in the world, 50 of them African. Uh, he, uh, he, he has a global reach, and I know he has been invited to Harvard, to Amherst, Cornell, I think, you know, and other places to talk about this phenomenon, because it's a kind of people are talking about it as a phenomenon, you know, uh, in, a, in Vienna, I believe, no, it's Vienna or Venice. It's Vienna? Yeah. They had an expression about the transition project for a whole year and so on, you know. Uh, he is very Kenyan, <laughs> Moses Kilaro. And I get, I, I really get inspired by him, Richard O'Wall and others you work with, you know, right? Yeah, it's very inspiring to... Okay. To, yeah. to I'm told we are running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. can I add something, because we're talking about um, the young people here as well. Sure. Yeah, so just to add to, to what Fafa said, so what Moses Kilola and his team did was to make literary history, right? You know, so now Fafa's short story is the most translated short story uh, in, in, in the African literary history. So if you're a PhD student or you're thinking about doing a master's a thesis in, in writing and so on and so forth, you know, will you do the same old tired thing of, uh, I don't know, Woodsworth, I don't know, you know, or will you look at how translating between African languages uh, and create theories that are dealing with how translating between African languages might be different, uh, maybe different from translating between French and, um, let's say, French and English. In other words, uh, the future of originality, as I understand it, and now, now I've put on my scholarly hat, the future of, uh, yeah, of, of scholarly innovation and, uh, you know, and originality and so on and so forth lies in the untapped resources in our, Africa, in our African languages. It's, it's interesting that um, you've gone in that direction. I'm told we're running out of time, but what I am going to do... We always have time. <laughs> <laughs> what I am going to do, um, with uh, the permission of our organizers, I'm going to ask three more questions, okay, from here, and then I will take two questions from the floor. Yeah. And we are not going to do that Kenyan thing that says, mine is not a question, it is a comment. No, 
ask a question that starts with where, when, why, how, what. Okay? And then we'll take it. But let's come back here. We were just getting scholarly, which is exciting. I was thinking, so 50 years ago, Prof, you led this great movement with others like uh, the late great Henry Warren Yumba at the University of Nairobi. 1969, you led this great movement to decolonize the curriculum. Yeah. And we saw more brown and black names come to the curriculum, a kind of black aesthetics. Um, and then the whole development of what we call oricha or oral literature, the kind of performance that you saw here from the drama group and saying that that too is literature. It doesn't have to be written. It doesn't have to be in a language that um, belongs to the canon. It can be uh, an African language. And that was a remarkable revolution. I want to ask, Mukoma, what's the balance of the work with that? Do you think that you, as a scholar, have pushed the frontiers of what your father and others in his generation did to turn um, the practice of literature to the next level? What's the balance of the work in that decolonizing of the curriculum? Yeah, so, so what decolonizing the mind, you know, and, and the whole, you know, the, the colonial movement, if you want to call it that, has done is to make me try to understand why, you know, it's as if it's pushed me backwards, actually, right? To look back into our literary history. And in my book that just came out, my scholarly book that just came out last year called The Rise of the African Novel, in that novel I'm asking why we begin our literary clock, our Af African literary clock with, uh, with Chinua Chebe, or Emo Sotiola when we're most generous, right? And then we move on to Adichie and so on and so forth. Where we don't talk about, for example, early South African writers, who are writing in African languages from the 1880s to, let's say, the 1940s, you know, and they're writing in African languages and then getting translated into English. And they weren't just one off, right? Literary critics, when you talk about them now, we talk about them as if, oh, it was just one guy out there who was writing. Right, there were a movement. They're the same people who started the ANC. They're the same guys who gave us the Inkosi Seleli Africa, right? A person like Saul Plage had gone all the way to the US, met with, uh, with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. In other words, you know, they were a movement, right? So the question for me becomes, why? do we begin our African literary clock at the wrong historical period? And then you can go back further and ask, okay, Amharic literature itself begins in the 1200s, right? Why don't we talk about Amharic literature, Afro-Arab literature, 500 AD? Why don't we talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, slave narratives, Afri Afri black American slave narratives as part of African literature? So, so yes, part of decolonizing is not just about moving forward. I think it's going back and recovering uh, this history because first, the literary history is there, you know, the, uh, uh, so at some point as a scholar, I, I just fail to understand how this happened, right? Yeah, but, but I do have an answer in the rest of the African novel. Um, okay, I, and, and that's a fair point, that there's a lot of going back to do. But what about going forward? I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you talked about uh, your children, four of your children as published writers, and I'm asking myself, why have they all been so conservative in their treatment of the novel as a Western form um, I heard in one of your interviews, one of your joint interviews, how your father introduced you to this fictional character as a family. He'd always tell you stories about Mwangi Cowboy. Mm -hmm. And Mwangi Cowboy is something that you all share, and everybody has added to that story. You have uh, several detective novels, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, Nairobi Heat, there's Black Star, there's Mrs. Shaw. Uh, Dosho has a, a detective novel as well. Wanjiko's The Fall of Saints is also a detective novel. Why hasn't Mwangi mm -hmm. Cowboy become something that you guys all write, so that we have a published novel that is by four or five people. Why are we sticking to the Western tradition that says the novel can only be mm -hmm. the creation of one individual who gets credit, mm -hmm. and yet we've just talked about how communally you work. So I'm thinking, with form, have you been a little conservative? Is there a little boundary that you can push? Um, so, I mean, okay, okay, it's a fair point. Uh, when it comes to Mwangi Cowboy, right? We, have, we haven't mined Mwangi Cowboy well enough. But, but I would say, I, I mean, as, as far as I understand myself, you know, that I'm one of the people who are pushing the boundaries, actually, right? First, uh, even when we think about aesthetics, right? The detective, the, 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 the detective novel popular fiction hasn't had much respect, right? Now it's, now it's happening, you know, and it's happening because it's not just me there, you know, I think there's a movement amongst, um, amongst my generation and the younger generation of saying, no, the novel cannot just be one thing. Um, you know, and I would go further and argue that that Odhiambo, for example, right, Odhiambo in a, in a, in Nairobi Heat is actually Mwangi Cowboy, right? In in, in other words, it, 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 to me, actually, you know, he is Mwangi Cowboy in that regard. Um, but definitely, definitely, there is room for innovation, and I think you know, young African writers are doing that, you know, better than 
you know, better than my generation. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful challenge you've put there about translating between uh, African languages and just pushing those frontiers um, all the time. I'm going to ask, um, I think let me do this because we could talk until tomorrow. I'm going to ask you, Prof, one last question. Well, so, he, he gets the last word. Uh, do you want me to give you the last word? I will. No, 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 no. To do with the same question, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> so, um, your career has been so successful in terms of just your sheer pr uh, productivity, how prolific you've been, but also, you know, dissertations have been written, um, awards have been given, many, many awards, honorary doctorates, one only from a Kenyan university, what is wrong with us? Um, but you have received a lot of recognition. Um, and then, so it's 2016, and you get nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. And, and I knew, and I knew, it was going to you knew I was going to go there? Let's go there because we're at home and you can confide in us. So you get nominated, articles are written, you know, in the mainstream media, in social media. There's expectation, bets are placed, breaths are held. There's a drum roll, we're waiting, we're waiting. And then the Nobel Prize in 2016 goes to Bob Dylan a white American pop singer who is recognized for his contribution to transforming the American folk music. How did you feel that morning when you woke up on Thursday, October 13, 2016, and you got the news of Bob Dylan's award? How did you feel? You're amongst family, okay. amongst friends. Okay. I can tell you a few stories. I'm, to, I'm, to just tell, I'm a storyteller, basically. So let me tell you a story. Not, not about that particular one. I think there was one time when the South American guy who I had won and they had put in the press that I would win. Okay? And even my university was so excited <laughs> that they sent oh there's a picture is it here? No. I don't show you my Nobel Prize picture. <laughs> <laughs> I think that one was a Nobel Prize picture. <laughs> So the University of California, I mean, but the University of California Irvine, because we have many others, you know, they sent photographers to prepare. First they set up a press conference at 11 o'clock the following day, and they sent photographers to have pictures ready for which they will spread to the whole world, okay? And now, <laughs> and my wife Jerry can tell you this, at four o'clock, you know, they announced it at mid some. At the time when they announced it in 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 uh, in, uh, in Sweden, it is actually four o'clock in the morning in California. What happened was, we found that there was paparazzi outside our house. To act, they count outside my house. Okay, it's Mombi who actually heard that someone had had won. So it was very interesting. It was, we opened the door for the uh, journalists, and they came in, and it was so sad. <laughs> now, what was it? It's my wife who is consoling them. <laughs> and made them coffee, you know. <laughs> now, let me just say, no, right, at least, as far as I'm, I don't write for prizes. <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. If a prize comes, I have no say, remember, I have, I have no say whatsoever yeah. in the decision making. What is my control is what I write. And it's, but I appreciate, there's one Nobel Prize I really appreciate, mm -hmm. what I call the Nobel, of the Nobel of the Heart. Nobel of the Heart is when I meet somebody here in Kenya or, or India or some places who comes across the table, I read your book, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and this is what happened to me. It has changed my life. And I say, my God, it was worth writing. It's, it's a kind of, there's something goodness about that. I, that one I call the Nobel of the Heart. The other one, I have no say whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. But of course, you as my daughter, mm. I know if you are a member, <laughs> <laughs> No comment. <laughs> you got voted for me. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, and, and thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, um, the Nobel of the Heart. 
literature is transformative. It transforms the life of not just the person who writes, but the one who reads and receives it. And the reward of the writer, the greatest reward of the writer, comes from sharing with that reader. Now, my little brother has demanded the last word. So I'm going to ask you as a literary critic, do these awards matter? What do they do for the discipline? Oh, I thought you'd just give me an open space to speak. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not doing comments today. We're answering questions. Yeah, no, well, of course. And I would say the ones that matter. OK, I know, I know the Kiswahili praise matters, for example, right? I know it matters because, in fact, I had this feeling of um, when we had just had the award ceremony this past Saturday, yeah. right? And the books that won last year had been published by Mbuki Nanyota, right? And I'm, I'm, you know, and, yeah, and there was a whole ceremony, the, you know, the, the guest of honor was the vice president, the minister of information was there, right? It was a whole ceremony, right? You know, they even had a, a cutting, ribbon cutting of the books, you know? But at some point I was like, yeah, you know, sometimes you get tired working on the prize, but then I look at that and I realize that those books wouldn't exist if the prize didn't exist, right? So for me, I'll say those prizes matter, right? Yeah. And I think the more prizes we have for African languages, the more they will matter. But really, the last word I wanted was to say, Titila Mama Litamu Hata Likiwa Laumboa. Lingina Alistamu. Kiswahili na Azimu Sifayo Iliofumboa. Kwa wasi wa Kufahamu ni imbe ilivyo kubwa. Toka kama mrizamu funika palipozibwa. Titile Mama Litamu jingine halishi hamu. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. we... Shall I take the two questions and you can wrap it up to the commentary? Yes, I'll, you can, yeah, yeah. can do that, please. Um, yeah. uh. You remember we promised today we are on our best behavior. We are asking two questions. One, two, Mark Chip. Uh, let me do this. Um, hmm. I think we should auction the, the, the Yeah, questions. shall we auction those questions? Who's absolutely ready? Remember, you, there are two and you want to be fair to the other person, so your question won't take 10 minutes. Please, ask your question. Start by telling us your name. My name is Lillian faculty member of theology department. My question goes to Professor Ngugi. You talk about how African languages inspire you. And we know that you've been a champion of African languages and writing in African languages. But my question is, what is the rationale to mm -hmm. you as a writer to write in an African language then have the work translated into English, for example, not other African languages? Because you know most of your work has been translated also into English. You write in Kuyu and then you have it translated in English. Yeah. What is the rationale? Thank you. Um, so the second one, right at the back, at the top in green. Please start by telling us your name. And if I look like I favored only the girls, that's because I did. <laughs> we are still um, in the battle to give African women voices, are we not? Because you were told to start the questions with when, I was, when I was a nine-year-old, I read, uh, <laughs> I read, I read uh, Ngogi's, uh, Ngogotengo's, uh, Jambanene and the Pistol. And so for me, it's a lifetime of conversations. But the question I want to ask uh, for relevant state at this point is, I have read work, huh? and I love his non-fiction work because it tells me the stories our grandmother, uh, my grandmother told me halfway. Um, but I've also read like his last book, Secure the Base, and I've recommended it to anyone who either works in the church. I'm a St. Paul's alumni of uh, divinity. Um, and so my, my question is to both uh, Professor and Mokoma. Because we, have, we, we are exposed to his nonfiction work, I mean his fiction work in the schools, how do we create a space for books like Secure the Base, which would be really le relevant for courses like international development or African studies. Asante. Uh, thank you for being so brief. No, we will not do this. Um, how do we, where do we start? Age before beauty or? Well, maybe we should start with beauty. <laughs> Let's start with beauty. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, no, I, no. No, first I wanted to take just a little tangent, you know, because I was, I was in a, and, and, you know, we're in a place of theology, so I just want to throw this out there as something we should think about. Uh, because something that really, really bothered me, um, I was in Ghana uh, just two or three weeks ago, and I went and visited the slave castles there, right, you know, and the most striking thing for me there was that you'd have a dungeon where the slaves were kept, you know, before they were shipped off to the point of, no, you know, the point of no return and so on and so forth, 
but you'd have a dungeon there, and then on top of that, you'd have a church. Literally. Like, there's no, you know, the church isn't twice removed and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to leave that image out there for us, you know, to think about that, that sort of relationship between... Uh, and, and of course, I understand the concept of liberation theology and so on and so forth, but I just, I, I just wanted to share that with you so it's not with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, but I don't know, we, I think we need... We, we need to take ourselves seriously, right? It, it, talking about, you know, creating spaces for, for literary theory. We need to take ourselves seriously and start introducing literary theory and start asking questions, like I was, like I was asking of why we begin the literary novel in the 1950s and, and so on and so on and so forth. So for me, I would say, yeah, I think we need to take all our total cultural output uh, very seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned secure the base. And many people may not know what you are referring to, but do actually have a book called Secure the Base, Making Africa Visible in the World. Uh, the book has not been published in Kenya yet, uh, so, uh, but I am sure it will be published in Kenya. But the question of secure the base is very, very important, even in the way I look at languages. Having your base in an African language does not in any way mean that you are antagonistic to any other language. That's very, very important. It's a question of relationship between languages that matters, right? I love after all, I love English language. After all, professor, I'm not only professor, I'm a distinguished professor <laughs> of English and comparative literature. It's a beautiful language, it's given us great writers, and so on. I love French, I love Russian literature, and so on. You know, it's the relationship between our languages that I fight against. You know, my philosophy is sound by, by this sentence, that if you know in all the languages in the world and you don't know your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that's enslavement. On the other hand, if you know your mother tongue and add all the languages of the world to it, that's empowerment, right? So for instance, can I say, mother tongue as a foundation, the secure the base, okay? Kiswahili add to it. English and a number of other languages, okay? <laughs> what I've been fighting against also is going to hierarchy. It's doing a lot of harm in relation between languages all over the world, not just in Africa, where we can never see language in terms of network, where they relate on basis of equal give and take, but they relate in terms of hierarchy. Okay, I don't like English hierarchy of being at the top, but then I go ahead and say, okay, should be at the top. You reproduce the hierarchies all the time.